Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our webinar on recruiting quality talent in an ultra-competitive marketplace. We are going to talk today about how to boost desirability in a market before the job is ever even posted. So we have a lot of great things today for you. As always, please do ask questions in the question box or in the chat box on the GoToWebinar panel. We will try to get to them today during the webinar if we are able. Otherwise, we will definitely follow up with you afterwards via email, so stay tuned for that. And without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. So your speakers today are myself, Kenzie Daynert. I'm Director of Sales Development here at AdTaxi. I've been in the digital marketing space for about nine years, and I love to travel with my new baby. Um, she is actually 10 months today. And Congratulations. She, you know, I've survived so far, and she's still alive. 10 months. Um, <laughs> so I'm Jim Jobe. I'm the director of Search and Social. I have been in digital marketing since 98, since before MySpace was a thing. And as opposed to having a 10-month-old, I've got a 26 and a 28. We enjoy Special Olympics and living in the outdoors in Colorado. Awesome. Not that we live outdoors. But, you know. <laughs> so today we're going to take you through employment trends that we see today in 2019. Who are these job seekers that are out there looking for jobs right now? What does a day in their life look like? And how do you reach these job seekers? And then finally, we have three great case studies for you to showcase how you can actually put this into practice. So let's start with some trends. Um, these are interesting. They're pulled from a couple of different places, uh, Glassdoor and Tech Media. But one thing is how people are finding jobs has changed. And you all may have experienced this as well. So reaching these, potent, reaching these potential employees um, really is starting to follow marketing trends versus just job boards. So it's changed the, the way that people find jobs, um, and there's new search methods. People are, companies are really striving to get diversity right, so it's important to have a diverse uh, candidate pool that you can pull from. We also see that the, there's an aging workforce. So this is going to drive labor shortages as the workforce continues to age and is not replenished. So job seekers um, and employers are bracing for a recession. It's, you know, a hot topic right now. Are we going to see one in the next year? Who knows? Um, but they are bracing for that. And AI is expected to create more jobs than it is destroyed. They're just different jobs. Um, and finally, teaming up with that automation. So the, the trend we really see here is handing over those mundane tasks, those things that are repetitive and really easy for an AI tool or computer to do, and then let humans be human and really focus on the more valuable aspects of their job. Those are the trends that we see and uh, put into place today. So really, we're seeing a power shift. Whereas it used to be the employer's market, now it is the job seekers market. So we're witnessing a power shift as job seekers leverage their market position and employees make an impact with their voice. It's kind of a paradigm shift or a paradigm shift. <laughs> Depends how you want to pronounce it. But job seekers aren't applying for jobs so much as employers are applying for candidates. And, you know, that's a huge shift over how it was 10 years ago. Yeah. And our uh, ability to address that and to uh, to market to that um, affects our ability to hire new talent. Absolutely. So we'll go through some of those today. What is the employment, employment landscape? Well, there's not a lot of candidates, right? So right now our national unemployment is about 3.7%. In many cities, I believe including Denver, where Jim and I are sitting today, 2% is the unemployment rate which means that there are a lot of unfilled jobs, about 7 million throughout America, and 2.27 million new jobs that need filled as well. This is kind of uh, scary or, or exciting, whichever you want to look at, but you know, as Jim mentioned, we saw during the recession um, a ton of potential candidates and the you know, job unemployment rate was very high, and that was due to a recession. But now that we've bounced back from that and we see that the unemployment rate is so low, we might think that it'll balance back out. But when we look at the, the predictions by the U.S. Census, 
that there will likely be more retirees in America than children under 18 by 2035. That just means that this trend of a low unemployment rate is likely to continue. Job openings have hit 6.9 million in July of 18, which was up from 6.2 million the previous year. And you can see in this graph, it's just continuing to increase. While the number of employed has surpassed recessionary levels um, and hit 1.16 or 161.8 million in August of last year. And this is really the kicker. There used to be about 6.6 .6 unemployed persons for every job opening. So you had, you know, between six and seven people to choose from. It was really an employer's market. Whereas now, or in last year, in July, it hit less than one person, so 0.9 persons for every job opening. Way more jobs than there are people. Absolutely. So overall, what does this mean for the marketplace? The cost, the time, and the competition to recruit with a fewer qualified candidates. This can make for a really frustrating position to be in if you're a recruiter because it's costing you more. It's taking more time. I think I saw a stat somewhere around two to $4,000 per candidate to recruit. And it can take months on end depending on who you're recruiting. So a lot of cost, a lot of time, and then there's a lot more recruiters out there vying for that same small candidate pool. But today, we hope to give you some tools that can help you combat that. So first, we need to understand who is the job seeker? Let's profile these people. Who are we trying to get in front of? So we have active and passive. And so active job uh, seekers are people who are actively looking for a full-time or a part-time job. And they may be employed, they may be unemployed, um, but they are looking for full-time or part-time and taking proactive means to do that, whether that be search or social, or whatever they're doing, they're letting it be out there and they're looking to get a different job or a new job or a job. Passive is somebody who is happy with their current situation, isn't particularly interested, they're not actively seeking, but they've got big ears and they're open to opportunity. Mm -hmm. And because of the employment rate, more and more, as opposed to 10 years ago, we need to be getting our candidates from the pool of passive job seekers. Absolutely. Because there may not be anybody actively looking for the job that we have posted. So what's an example or a profile of this active job seeker? Well, generally, an active job seeker is someone who is, like I said, they may be unemployed by choice right now, um, or they could be employed, but they're they're dissatisfied or looking for different hours, benefits, schedule, or pay, right? So there's some pain point there that is leading them to want to, and it could be they have a glass ceiling or they're not going to get promoted or there's nowhere for them to move vertically in their organization. Yeah. So. Or potentially a recent grad. Could I be a recent another, grad. another active, but the example that we have here are nurses, right? So you could be, um, a nurse and you really want different hours or different a different schedule. Maybe you haven't gotten a raise in a while, um, so you're really dissatisfied there. Whereas our passive job seeker, tell me a little bit about who these people are. So the passive job seeker, they say, it's someone who's just, they're, they're happy with their current one and they're not going to leave someplace for a dollar, but they may leave someplace for ten dollars. Right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they're moving, they're progressing, there's nothing they can put their finger on that makes them dissatisfied with their current situation, but they're open. Um, you know, they may be making $100,000 a year. They're not going to leave what they're currently doing for 105, but if someone hit them upside the head with 180, they would. Yep. So these could be highly skilled workers that you want to get in front of, or maybe it's a stay-at-home mom who is, her children are at school and so she's got four or five hours a day to kill. On the part-time basis, it's absolutely spot on with what we see. The other thing is, is that with the percentage of the population that is, I don't want to be ageist because I'm on the upper end of the age, but uh, in marketing or doing jobs and career growth and counseling for millennials, 
they are much more in tune with the culture of the company and the mission of the company. So a uh, passive job seeker for them may be that they're looking to make more of an impact. A lot of them don't care about the pay. A lot of them don't care about the benefits, but they want to make a difference. And you can attract and recruit these people um, by positioning yourself as you do make a difference. Yeah. Yeah, the, the example that we'll show later on, which is not all heroes wear capes. Yep, this is true. So, but both passive and active candidates, so both pools of people here, they have a few things in common. So we pulled some stats. The majority of them are online. So even those people that are in retirement and maybe coming out of retirement, so these are us people that are job seekers, even 84% of people who are retired and looking to come out of retirement are online. And you can see across the board, everybody is online to find their job. Similarly, there's a digital reliance. So people are on social search um, looking for jobs, which I find this very interesting. If you look at job boards, so um, you've got search as a search engine, and 93% of people, anywhere from 87 to about 95% of people are using search, Google search, to find a job. Also, these people are on Facebook. The hours spent daily, so 93% of people are spending time on Facebook every single day. Whereas, you look at the job boards, who are using job searches and specific job search functionality and boards to look for jobs, that's much lower than it maybe once was. So what is a day in the life of a job seeker? They might be, let's take this for example, this is 10 different touch points, and this could be over the course of a week or over the course of several months. But, you know, I might be watching TV and I see an ad for an MBA program, and it really gets me thinking about what I'm doing in my job right now. And so this could be, this is considered, you know, addressable TV. So I'm seeing an ad on the biggest screen in the house. Well, I start to think, maybe I need to do something different. So I start on search, right? So search engine marketing, and I see some ads there for a different culture, or maybe it's a pain point of mine that I start that search of why I want a change. I maybe am looking at some different blogs. It could be search or related to work, or it could be related to what I want to make for dinner that night. But I start to see ads, uh, display ads for different career opportunities. And as Jim mentioned, uh, millennials care a lot about, you know, what is the, the social message of a company. So maybe I want to work somewhere that has days off for volunteering or has a mission like that. So I start to see ads about that. I go to a few different websites and checking them out. Maybe I'm over on YouTube trying to figure out how to do my hair or makeup tutorial. <laughs> Who knows? And, um, and I see another ad, and it's talking really about that culture. And again, and, and I keep seeing this great brand of this company that maybe I had never heard of or considered working for, but it's, it's really speaking to me. You know, I might narrow this down to about two different places that I'm really now considering changing my job. And I narrow it down, and I apply um, I'm thinking about two different places to apply, but I haven't pulled the trigger yet. I've looked at the actual specific job pages. I'm very interested, but maybe I haven't had time yet. So now I'm, you know, over on some other blogs, and I'm retargeted. So I'm, you know, see that ad again for that company about their great culture. It's really starting to sell me to work there. Um, finally, I'm on Facebook, looking around. Again, I'm engaging with that brand, and ultimately, I search for that company, I decided, hey, you know what, I want to work there, I want to try to work there, let me go fill out that application. However this job seeker gets to your application portal, the main point is it's not a one and done. I don't see an ad for a job and immediately fill out that application. This is over, this is 10 different touch points in which I'm, you know, really learning about the brand of the business and really being sold should I work for that company? So look at the paradigm shift there. From 10 years ago, but from 30 years ago, it was a race. The minute a job was posted online, and the quicker you could get your application in, the better your chances. And now that there's fewer than 6.6 .6 people, you know, unemployed people per uh, job opening, now you can take your time and make decisions and make choices and contemplate 
as you're going through the journey. And it's important to, it's naive to assume anymore that someone is going to race to your front door, fill out your application, and wait on a decision. Um, now, if they've revealed themselves to you as being in the market, it's incumbent upon us to follow them beside them on that journey. Absolutely. So what are some tactics we can use to reach job seekers? This is key. First and foremost, recruitment is marketing. Um, as I had said earlier, you know, kind of the paradigm shift is that now it's not so much a candidate selling us on him, it's us selling uh, our, our company to him. And so we need to address this and come to this from a marketing standpoint, that we are selling our job at our company and our culture to an applicant. Absolutely. And 84%, if you remember, of, those, of any employment class is online. These people, 97% of full-time workers are online, so that passive audience that, you know, maybe isn't actively looking. And 9 out of 10 engage in search and social, the majority of that being Google and Facebook, which, if you look at traditional marketing, um, marketing for any sort of retail brand or on, you know, the marketing team outside of recruitment, they're accessing and trying to sell people using Google and Facebook. So very similar tactics can be applied to your recruitment. There is a gap, however, in recruiting versus what people are using or applying to jobs. 65% of people say they've actually used Facebook to search for a job opening, whereas 87% of recruiters still prefer LinkedIn. So there's a gap there that you can access and start to, start to engage with people from a recruitment perspective on Facebook. There's not, it's not as saturated with recruiters as LinkedIn is. And 70% of candidates uh, visit a company's website via their mobile device to check out career opportunities, and 50% of those people um, are using their phones to apply for an op open position, whereas only 13% of companies report investing in mobile recruitment. That is a massive gap that mobile is your friend, and you really need to have a mobile strategy for your recruitment section of your website in today's market. Truly. And so, you know, here's a tactic for doing that. Because ultimately, what we want people to do is fill out an application. Mm -hmm. Cumbersome, not a good user experience, 50% of the time, as the previous slide showed, when you're on the mobile device. Yep. So some workarounds are, in pulling people through, is from the mobile, you know, when they get go to your website via mobile, because they're doing the search on mobile, get them to a landing page that is mobile responsive, and then rather than have them try to fill out this cumbersome application on this little tiny screen that is not mobile responsive, most mm -hmm. applications aren't, let's just get them to reveal themselves to us so that we can make it easier for them. So oftentimes what we see as good workarounds is a kind of a form submit button, which requests, you know, basically the company, please send me an application, that way it shows up in the email box. Because this guy's not going to remember to go to that site when yep. he gets in front of the desktop, right? So let's make it easy for him to, to get to us later on. Um, also, you know, email an application where they usually have that on the mobile device where they can upload it. And then all of this, that's not going to be official. I can't hire the guy off of that. But now he's revealed himself to me and I can get in touch with him. And I have some preliminary information with which I can either qualify him for further consideration or not without forcing him to do the cumbersome non-user experience of doing that. And then the whole thing that you want to do is have an opportunity to do the follow-up. Absolutely. So have a simple landing page, ask for an email address if somebody is interested in applying. You'll email them the application so they don't have to do it on their mobile device. But now you have their email address. So if they forget to do that, you can follow up with them, reach out, have your recruiter talk to them. And this is very effective because people expect a personalized approach. Job boards used to boast 30 to 40% effectiveness. They're really now seeing only about 10% effectiveness. So this is, as Jim has mentioned, a huge paradigm shift in how people used to apply for jobs, find jobs, 
you're, you were on a job board with all of your competi- all of your competitors, whereas people really want a personalized experience. They're not looking for, I mean, 10 years ago they were, right? Same reason, boy, the minute it came open, you ran down there because there weren't that many jobs, and so you went to the job board. Now I have my choice. I don't need to see the list of jobs. I need someone to personally come up to me and say, hey, Jim, we want you. Yep. And you also, as a, as a company that is looking at hiring, uh, don't want to be in with all of your competitors. Right, so if you're doing part-time job, uh, hiring for a kind of an entry-level position, you don't want them to see all of the other part-time positions that pay 50 cents an hour or more. Get them to yours and sell them on you. So isolate the candidate. And we'll tar- show you some targeting options for that um, later on. Then once they have revealed themselves to you, once they have said, we are interested, they have checked out the, the listing on your site, You want to stay in front of them through retargeting. And this is really the foundation of any marketing program. And again, recruitment is marketing, so it should be a foundation of your recruitment strategy as well. But an applicant visits your site, and they go to the recruitment section of your site. They, you capture that data. You say, this person has come to look at my job, so I've captured that data. Now I want to serve them an ad wherever they go, whether that be on social, you want to serve them an ad on their Facebook feed, you want to serve them an ad on the different blogs that they go to look at, even on their connected TV device, you can serve them a video ad or search. So they're back on Google and they're searching for job openings. Let's stay in front of them and make sure that you are top of mind. And how can we do this throughout the journey? So there's various different targeting strategies that you can apply to your campaign. First-party targeting is going to be anything that you own. So that's the pool of people who come to your recruitment section of your site, that pool of data. That is your first-party data on their other devices as well. So you can, again, people might start this journey on mobile and then submit the application on their desktop. So why not retarget them and keep messaging consistent throughout that path? Third-party targeting is going to be data you do not own, but things like job titles. So job titles are in Facebook. Let's target people with an ad there um, and get them over to your site. And maybe you have great people that you want, you know, the people that are on your site follow a certain demographic. Let's find people that look just like them, right? So look like modeling as well. And then, of course, anything can be geo-targeted. So if you know people will only travel however many miles to work at your location, that should be part of your targeting strategy as well. How can we leverage search? So search is really going to be for the active job seeker um, because people are looking for that specific job on Google. I mean, it's the perfect place. It's the lowest hanging fruit, right? So an active job seeker, how do you identify someone who might be interested in working four hours a day uh, fulfilling grocery orders? It's someone who's looking for part-time jobs. So let's get those. How do you identify people who might be interested in driving a truck? It's people who are looking for truck driving jobs or driver jobs or delivery jobs and on and on and on. So that is the lowest hanging, but it's naive anymore for us to assume that they're just going to come to our website, fill out the application, and call it a day. So the remarketing, as we've gone over and over, is key, but we can also remarket via text ad. So as they're on Google, once they've done this search, they've come to our website, they've left without revealing themselves, we can do uh, text ads on endemic and systemic sites around. The biggest one is like ad extensions, the utilization of ad extensions. So someone who is looking for part-time job, and I am a large retail, and I have a lot of part-time openings. I have customer-facing part-time openings on the sales floor as a cashier, but I also have non-customer-facing as loading dock, help, and stocking help. Well, somebody's looking for a part-time job, maybe looking for any one of those, but I don't know yet. And I don't want to post my cashier job and not be attractive to the guy who's looking for a loading dock job, right? So the ad extensions allow me then to kind of lift the category of my job. And that 
enables me to engage that person who's looking generically for a part-time job in something more specific, narrow his focus, increase my application rate. And then, as with everything, over 50% of these job seekers are going to be using their mobile device. People, be mobile responsive, adapt, mm -hmm. and conquer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then to reach that half of job seekers. So somebody who, again, this is a huge marketplace when right now there's, no, there's less than one person per job opening uh, that you have to pull from. So you really need to activate this path of job seeker. And we can look at this in a couple different ways. So the first was, you know, we were looking at, because this example here has nurses. So how do you identify people who are looking for nursing jobs? Well, it's people who are looking for nursing jobs, but that's not gonna fill all your jobs. So the second one is doing an influence. And in this particular example, you know, there are several uh, platforms that we have that people have uh, designated what their job title is or what industry they are in. So I can target nurses with kind of a recruitment campaign and knowing what uh, are the pain points is for nurses of their current one, I can, on Facebook, in an example like this, I can put an ad up in front of nurses that, you know, states four 10-hour days instead of three twelves or whatever it might be, or work nights or work days or day shifts available or any of that type of thing where I'm getting somebody and I'm trying to influence them to come to me. And by targeting people uh, with the job title that I'm hiring for, I can disconnect them from where they're currently working. You know, it's pretty funny, too. If I'm nurses, I'm just making up a number. But there's like a million nurses, but there's one and a half million openings. So it's like nurses just rotate every two years. They go to a different hospital. Yeah. <laughs> and eventually they end up back where they started out, but it takes them 15 years and no one remembers. <laughs> Well, and no, that's a great point. But then there's also the more general branding. So if you always are hiring for a position or you always need those medical workers, but you don't know that you need just or anesthesiologist nurses right now, then maybe you do a branding campaign to you know people who are in the medical world and you show them the great benefits that your hospital or that your you know company has. And so you're staying in front of them, you're giving them positive branding, and then when they're ready to move or look for a job, it's an, invest, it's an investment in filling next year's opening. And we find it very effective when we do it specifically to industry like medical professionals. Um, Truck driving is another yeah. one that's always hiring. All those. And so you just put in cultural, you put in, and by cultural, I mean, you know, it's like the culture funnest. Uh, best workplace of 2017, or best lunchroom, or most flexible hours because they have yoga. Most flexible. <laughs> yeah, I got yoga. you. I guess. <laughs> Never mind. Love that <laughs> So another tactic you can apply is real-time bidding, or also known as display advertising or programmatic. And essentially, this is where you can target your ad to again whoever you're looking to get in front of. With, and you can do this with a static ad. So this is an example here. It's a bit hard to read, but this is not all nurses wear capes. So this is, again, that, um, you know, branding ad, staying in front of people. And then you can do this also on the connected TV device. So this cross-device targeting, let's get in front of people on the largest device in their household. Maybe you have a great video of that work-life balance. So you can have time to go uh, surfing, something like that. And for, and for yeah. those of you who aren't aware, how connected TV works is not unlike how RTV works. And so what that amounts to is Kinsey and I could be next door neighbors, both watching Game of Thrones Ooh. at the exact same time. You know, I've never watched it. I've never seen it. Not oh, one episode. But at any rate, we could both be watching Game of Thrones, and she is going to get different ads than I am. I'm going to get ads that are relevant to me based on what I have revealed of myself, um, and she is going to get ads that are relevant to her. So if you were a nurse instead of yeah. a marketing professional, you might very well get this ad. And me, as a truck driver, is going to get a different ad. Absolutely. Kind of cool. And then finally, on pre-roll. So I might be over on ESPN looking up the latest tennis match or whatever it might be, and I get another ad that talks about that company culture 
Um, it's a video that comes through. So there's a lot of different mediums and ways you can stay in front of people and showcase why they should come and work at your business. But the key here is how do we track success? So we can put up all these ads, but we really want to make sure that we are spending the money as effectively as possible. So there's two main ways, an ad is served and somebody clicks on the ad. So we can directly tie that to the campaign. But oftentimes, people aren't clicking on ads. I see ads all the time. We see that 8% of users account for 85% of the clicks. So the majority of people see the ad, they have an, it has an impact, but they don't directly click. Instead, let's track how many people saw the ad, didn't click, but later maybe searched for your brand and went to your site and then filled out an application there. So you want to make sure that we're looking at both people who come directly from the ad or people who are influenced by the ad and then later fill out an application. This will inform us how successful or how effective is that campaign. You know, years ago, it was Furniture Dealer in Chicago, that I know half my marketing works, I just don't know which half. And with our ability to track things digitally now, uh, now I believe that he would say, I know my marketing works, I just don't know which 10% doesn't. <laughs> Because we've yeah. got the ability to to get attribution deep into the funnel. Yep, absolutely. And we really need to sequence our messaging as well. So if you're like me, you've got several devices, a phone, a laptop, maybe a tablet, and you don't want to stick, send the same ad to the same person on both their desktop and their mobile and their tablet. If I've already seen your brand on my mobile phone and checked you out, then give the sequence that message. Give me a different message when I'm on my desktop device. We know 90% of consumers start a task on one device and finish it on another. Again, sounds just like those people who are checking you out on their mobile device and then it's too cumbersome to fill out that application, so they come back later, fill it out on their uh, desktop. So employing cross-device tracking is in, in crucial. Um, you might wonder, what, how, how do we know this? Um, and if you log in to your Facebook or your Google or any of those accounts through on both your mobile and your desktop and your iPad, that is some of the data that is used to identify the same person across multiple devices. Exactly. <laughs> I was going to give an old, tiny example. Oh, yeah. So there used what to be it? these Burma Shade ads. So you'd be driving down like a highway. And there would be like 27 signs in a row that progressed you through it. And that's what this is doing. I mean, this is A, then B, then C, then D. And it doesn't matter what device you're on, right? It doesn't matter whether you're looking out the left window or the right window, going back to my burma shade. You're still looking out and you're the same yep. person. And this just makes uh, a more linear story and for a more linear journey. So what is the company? What jobs do we have open? Why work for us? Here's our benefit. Here's somebody, a testimonial of a happy, happy employee. Our visit, open house next Tuesday. Yep, all of that. And we're going to borrow this from our friends over in automotive. They look at VDPs or vehicle description pages. What we find is when we optimize to people looking at a car online, we see more price quotes. The same principle can apply in recruitment. If we optimize, to people looking at job postings on your website or those job pages, that is going to drive applications. You might not have data on people actually filling out the applications to, to be able to make smart marketing decisions, but instead you have more data of who is looking at your, uh, your job posting page. And the more of those you get, the more applications you can get. Absolutely. And we see a direct correlation, and again, Sometimes this is going to take a while. If I'm a passive job seeker, it might be two, three months before I fill out that application, um, whereas somebody who's active might be a week or two. But there's going to be a, a bit of a lag. So you, so you need to be a little bit more strategic with setting up a campaign um, than just saying, I want end application. And this slide may take just, I'll be quick, I promise. Yeah. So to the left of that line, we are optimizing towards price quotes. And we weren't getting a whole lot. To the right of that line, we optimized towards the vehicle page visits, and we got a bunch more quotes. And that was just the 
explaining that. Yes, absolutely. And so on social, how can we leverage social media for recruitment? As we saw that most, you know, most recruiters are on LinkedIn, but the majority of people looking for jobs and um, are leveraging Facebook. So how can we shorten that gap a little bit? So there's a couple things that we can do on Facebook. And so one of the best is, is, is the remarketing platform. I mean, it's fantastic for that because it's the most engaged visitor, right? So you're basically your uh, ad takes up the entirety of the screen. There's several different formats for both passive and active job seekers that we can do. One is lead ads, where we're driving people in on Facebook to basically you're giving them some information and asking them to reach out to you. And that's all done within the Facebook platform and it doesn't drive them away. We've seen that the increase in engagement on video ads has gone through the roof. Uh, consumers are preferring video ads and video ads can be shown on Facebook where uh, it might be, you know, more of a lifestyle within the hospital. God, I keep going back to the mm -hmm. nurses. Okay. Or whatever, or a truck driver, you know, running down the road in a brand new rig, that type of thing. But we can be very targeted in that. Most of our campaigns are these conversion ads where we're trying to get people to come to our career page of our website. And by targeting the job title and then having that as the conversion point, tremendously effective. Absolutely. And the message is going to be different based on the platform and based on whether you're prospecting or trying to recruit people or you're staying in front of these people who you've already revealed yourself to. So prospecting overall, you're introducing yourself. So if I, if I met you today and I said, hi, my name's Kenzie, and then tomorrow I, I see you again and I say, hi, my name's Kenzie, that'd be pretty awkward. You don't want to do that with your online marketing either or your recruiting. So similarly, when you're prospecting or you're looking for that an inter, you know, initial interaction with a potential candidate, you want to introduce your brand and share what career opportunities you might have open or available to them. Now, once they come to your site and show interest in that job posting or that job posting page, now you really have to sell them. So now you share ads around company culture Maybe you share, you know, perks about the um, different things that you have. You have a gym at the office or things like that. Or perhaps you share a signing bonus. So a signing bonus is a great um, one under search because it can be an ad extension. So it can be that call-out extension that says, you know, open job today, signing bonus. So really be thoughtful or mindful of the platform in which you're sharing the message and are you introducing yourself? or are you staying in front of people with retargeting? And then the metrics. So we only are as good as we can really track. So we need to know what works best. The journey again, just like marketing, because recruitment is marketing, we first have to be, people have to be aware of your brand before they can take the next step, which is consider working for you versus somebody else. So overall, in awareness, I really like to look at the impression volume. How, how much of your message did you get out there to the marketplace or to potential candidates? And how many of those people came back to the career page? That is really critical because you are trying to get people to the career page. People that go to your product or services page, that's part of that marketing uh, function of your business, not recruiting. So we really want to focus on people that are going to that careers page. They might be considering you versus other places to work, and they could do that through requesting for more information um, or filling out a form. Maybe they're watching some videos you have on the company culture or on benefits. Um, and then we can work with those um, applicant tracking systems. We know that those are a favorite of most recruiters, so we are compatible to work with applicant tracking systems to see how many people are actually applying. And then quality matters. So how do we track and look at how many qualified candidates did you actually hire from the campaign? How many people engaged on social media, some of these ancillary benefits, and then that employee retention. How many people are loyal and then advocate to, or advocate to family and friends and things like that to also come work for you? So these are all metrics that really, really matter for recruiters to track the, the efficiency of their campaign. By the way, something we didn't talk about on the social is the ancillary benefit of that when you do the job title targeting 
is the person who sees that may not be influenceable, but they know someone who is. Absolutely. And they forward it over to them. Yep. Bing, bing, bing. They can share it. So let's look at a few real examples of how this is put into practice. I know we talked a lot about the theories and concepts, but this really does work. So this first one is a huge healthcare company, and this was kind of a statewide campaign. And hiring for different positions at different times, different clinics, different locations. So kind of as we had covered, there was kind of an always-on campaign that wasn't specifically targeting anything except medical professionals, and that was an investment in future applicants, mm -hmm. right? So that was one piece of it. Um, and then there was, uh, you know, display campaigns, social campaigns, native campaigns is kind of how we were going for that. But they were looking to fill open positions at the system level, and they had a very specific cost per application goal. Yep. And I will note this was a very large campaign. It was, um, you know, they're running about $50,000 a month. So take this with a relative approach there. But it was very effective. So I'll highlight the goal for the campaign was set at $37 cost per applicant. This was greatly exceeded. The cost per applicant and the overall cost per applicant between native, social, and display was $12.69. And again, this just talks about that, that buyer journey. So an application or an applicant could go through 10 different touch points. You really need to be in front of them on multiple different platforms um, or you know, if you look at platforms of social or display or multiple websites, different ways you can engage people, it will help drive down that cost per application rate for you. And the key to this, which was something you had alluded to earlier, um, was following them across the device. Mm -hmm. You know, whether they were on the desktop, the mobile, or a tablet. Yep. Stay in front of them and multiple touch points. Then, it's not a set it and forget it, right? So we always have to optimize, always have to keep working towards improving the campaign. You can see here that the initial uh, start of the campaign, we were hitting between, you know, a $12 and $32 cost per application. That's probably the average point. Sure. And which <laughs> exceeded, I will say, the exceeded goal. the goal by 50%. Absolutely, which is great. And then over time, so not, not to be complacent with it. So over time, improving the campaign, checking that view through, tracking all of this to see what is working and moving the money to what is working the best, we saw down into the less than $10 to $15 range top for application. Again, that was at about 12 bucks or so. Exactly. And, you know, once you get down there and you get your efficiency dialed in, there's only so fast the race car is going to go. Yep, true. And then it hung. Uh, a different campaign that we like to really highlight is a trucking campaign. So this was multiple locations, um, and they really found a challenge with attracting qualified drivers throughout the country. You know, just like I said with the nurses, there's like a million truck drivers, and there's a million point five openings for truck drivers. <laughs> yep. So they started this out with one location, maybe two locations. Um, said, let's see how this goes. And so, you know, we've had this for a number of years. Now we have all the locations. 18. So it went from two locations to 18 locations because it was so efficient. Yeah, over three years. But yes, and, you know, it's the number one, yeah, I mean, it's the recruitment tool. Yep. There's several things that lead to its success. Yeah, so six, over 60% 60 of the clicks were generated from mobile devices. Makes sense. We're going to keep hammering this in. Make sure your mobile... Uh, strategy is dialed in. And especially for truck drivers. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's like They're hard, not to, hard to have a desktop right there in the spare seat where your dog is. Absolutely. And then you can see that the text ads were specific to the market. So looking at that home, home city or that home state that people are in. So there's different strategies to make sure that the text ads aren't all the same, that they're unique, and they have that, that call to action that's the person is going to care about who is going to apply for your company. And we also, just like we do in retail, right, mm -hmm. we're addressing the consumer concerns. And for truck drivers, you know, it's pay packages and respect. Yep, $5,000 sign-on bonus. Why wouldn't you want to click that? And similar to truck drivers is a charter bus company that we ran. 
Um, this one I find, I, I love the success here. So in, you know, let's say about a year and a couple months or so, they went from one location to four locations and from not having really any training classes to having two per month that they could fill. Yeah, this was a success for them. Their growth was hindered as many companies' growth is by the availability of talent, yep. um, of labor. And this and, is and active speakers on this on this particular campaign because we're looking at Google and Bing was the majority of the yeah. campaign. So a little difference there in looking at passive versus active. Some specifics on how this campaign works so well. So if we look at the ad copy itself, really again, giving people the why. Why choose that? What, is it, what are the ad extensions? So here's a great example of what ad extensions look like on that mobile device. Medical, dental, travel privileges, a 401k. Those are all really great call outs to why this option. Exactly right. But the key to this, campaign was really, this was one of the first ones several years ago that we treated as marketing. And so the key to this was changing their, you know, they had the old school job description on open positions, you know, it's like be a uh, bus driver for the enterprise level. You know, you couldn't even recognize that job if it was your job. Language, yeah. Yeah. And so... We approached them with making specific landing pages for the specific jobs that they had, and this is what came of that. And when we did this, and we and we changed this a little bit to take out the name of the company, replaced it with Charter Bus. But <laughs> when we did this, their applications went through the roof. When we started approaching this, we were getting the same number of people looking at it, but our conversion rate went up. When we approached the job seeker as a consumer and sold them on the company. Yeah, I find it really interesting because you look at most job boards or most job postings, and it has all the things that are required of the applicant. But And that's all at the top. And then maybe at the bottom, it showcases the benefits of working there. This flips it on its head. This says at the top, why should you want to work there? Why apply? Their family-owned business. They have medical, they offer dental, all of these really great, um, you know, call to action and, and reasons why I would want to work there. And then they have the requirements so you can self-select. Yeah, so you've, so you've bought the job and now you're seeing if you qualify. Exactly. And that's really the position you want to put yourself in is people wanting to work for you and then seeing if they're eligible. Exactly. Another piece of that campaign is, again, over time improving on it and you'll see it ramp up right so again we might have to you might have to look at branding and you might have to look at introducing yourself um, optimizing to job pages as opposed to the end application but in time you'll start to see that conversion um, increase so from september to march we saw it go from 132 clicks or so or conversions over to 712 so really, it takes a little bit of time for this to ramp up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and no worries. And then also, we want to look at, typically, you want to be within the first top two positions or so. So you'll see here, we're you know, right between the first and second position. And that's going to help your overall score. You're not paying to be number one all the time, but you're staying in the top, and especially on mobile, you really have to be at the top. You have to be at the top two positions on those results. Um, and then you can see here all the different types of keywords that drive the campaign. And these are only, this is only the top 20. You know, there's yeah. probably 150 different ways that you, we said bus driver. Yep. Um, and some of them were fairly broad. And what we look to do there then is, is with the text in the text ad, you select it down. Because somebody might be looking for a driver job. Uber. Could be Uber, could be a CDL Class A, yep. right? Uh, like an over-the-road trucker. So all those people are using the same search terms. So I want to be in front of them if I'm hiring for a bus driver job, but I don't want to click from the Uber candidate. No. So I will say clearly in my text ad, bus driving job. Charter class. Yeah. 
So that'll keep me from getting the click from them. It's getting down to the tactics and the strategy. I'll let you cover this next one. Absolutely. And so, <laughs> you know, all of these things you can do on your own. I think the difference is really finding people that can help you do it effectively and, again, drive that cost per application down. And so what we find works the best is people plus technology. People are going to do a great job, but how can we leverage technology to do an even better job? So we've created something called Quantum, which really helps us to optimize these campaigns to that lower, lowest cost per application. So conversion-based, really looking at what is that conversion that you want, and let's drive it there. It has a 93% retention rate. We're it works. <laughs> yeah, and we're agnostic. I mean, we are, you know, we're, we're optimizing conversion-based optimization within uh, platforms as well as cross-platforms. Yep. So search, whether it be search, social, RTV, we're looking at video ads. It doesn't matter. We want to move the money to whatever's working the best. So I'm going to, um, you know, I have a thank you page, but I want to leave it just on this follow-up page for you. This is a quick check sheet of how can you see where you stand in recruitment is marketing. So, you know, how, what does your brand look like in the marketplace? Are you highlighting any brands or awards um, as being a top employer? This might take you another step. You might have to go and actually apply for a top employer award. Um, but there's a lot of those out there. So what are the different steps you can take? Um, remember, remarketing is key to your campaign. So stay in front of people who have revealed themselves to you, who have gone to your jobs page or your careers page. Stay in front of them. Tell them why choose your company culture or your benefits or whatever it might be um, over another. You're really marketing to these people. Um, you know, if I was to, I mean, while they're reading this, yeah. if I was to look at that, I mean, no more, if you were hiring somebody and the guy came up to you and he said, you know, I'm a nurse and I'm looking for a position. And then he started walking off. You wouldn't let him go. You'd go, wait, 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 let's talk. And he'd say, you know, I've seen your, I've seen your website, and I'm not that interested in it. Well, what, what are you looking for? I mean, you're going to try to re-engage with him. Yep. You're doing that digitally on that. I just can't, number one, identify people who are actively in the market by doing a search campaign with keywords to describe your open positions. Don't expect people to come in and show you their belly and apply right away. <laughs> you're going to have to follow them around like a rabid dog and pull them through the journey with you, and then prospect by job title. Yep. You know, it's like you can go after people that look similar to your best employee, and you can go after people who have the same job title as what you're looking to hire for. And we have to be more creative when we only have 0.9 applicants per job opening than when we had 6.6. 6. Yeah. And finally, mobile, mobile, mobile. What is the experience for a candidate on mobile? So really take a hard look at that. Ask some people who maybe are your current employees of that job what they think, where they get confused. How uh, Ask for feedback from them um, and really take a hard look at your mobile devices. You know, the people that we work with in Europe call that mobile. Mobile, yeah. yeah mobile. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us. Please join us for future webinars. We have a couple coming up. We have, our next one is going to be on social media, so leveraging social media, a little deeper dive on that. Stay tuned. You can go to adtaxi.com backslash events to find our future webinars and events. We also have a lot of white papers and resources on our website at adtaxi.com backslash resources. Finally, you will get a recording of this webinar today. Um, check your inbox tomorrow for that. Thank you so much and share it with all your friends. Have a great day.